Welcome back to part three of the School Student Telecaster Build Project. And if you haven't seen the other two, go check those other uh, two parts out. This video series is intended for the students of the uh, electric guitar building class that I am teaching at a local college and their luthier program. And uh, anyway, we're making it available to everybody. So hopefully you're enjoying this. The last episode, we talked about fret slotting and this really cool jig system, the pre-pinning um, the jig to create the center line process. And uh, it's pretty cool how it works, but Peter commented that I didn't uh, mention how deep the frets were going, and I told him that I would include it in this video. And Peter, I'm sorry, you are correct. I totally thought that I covered that, um, but my mind is going a little bit, so sometimes I forget things. So thank you very much for bringing that up. So before we continue any further, and this for my students too, if they refer back to this in the future as they're going through this process, um, let's talk about fret depth. You may be using uh, whatever fret wire, it doesn't matter. This happens to be Stumac fret wire. Uh, number 152, this is kind of their most popular one. And this one spe specifically mentions a tang depth of 0 0.062 inches, 62 thousandths. That is equivalent to 1.58 millimeters. So you may be asking yourself, well, I only have to go then 1.6 millimeters deep. And if you were building a classical guitar, you would be correct because they have a pretty flat fretboard. But because we are doing a curve, a radius on the top, that radiusing process that we're going to do after the slotting process takes place is going to remove some of that uh, slot depth. So we have to account for that. So I've got this handy little picture that I did up in CAD to help illustrate that. So here, let me get that on the screen for you. Okay. So what you're looking at is two different radiuses or radii, uh, which is it? Anyway, let's get to the point here. What you'll see I, I drew out in CAD is an example at the heel width uh, and a 12 inch radius, you see that I'm going to lose 1.28 millimeters. Now at a 10 inch radius, you're going to lose more because it's a tighter radius and therefore it's going to curve down faster. So at the heel side, we're going to lose 1.53. Now if you think about that, you can add those up and you can say, let's say the 10 inch radius, 1.53 uh, plus uh, 1.58, we're right around 3.0 millimeters. Now, <clears throat> not all of it is going to remove that much because at the at the headstock side, the first fret area, you're not going to take as much as because the board's not as wide. So therefore, the, it's going to go off the edge of the board before it would achieve that 1.53 in the 10 inch radius model. So there's a compromise, and you kind of have to figure out, you know, where do I want to be? If I go too deep in the standard fret slotting procedure, then after you insert your fret wire, you're going to see too much of the slot. If it's with rosewood or ebony, not that big of a deal because you can take some of the dust and a little CA glue and you can fill that in, no problem. With maple, it becomes a little bit more of a deal because what you fill in maple with, i.e. maple dust, isn't really going to match. Once the CA is added, it's a lot darker, so you're going to see that. So you may choose different depths depending upon the fretboard material you have. In my case, I went just about 3.0, 3.0 millimeters, realizing that there's a possibility that I'm going to be ever so slightly shallow on the 20th, 21st, 22nd fret area, somewhere, somewhere down that way. All right, and, and in that case, I'm going to take a fret saw and just make them ever so slightly deeper with a gauge on there 
that stops my travel to exactly what I need for the fret wire itself. So I could set it for that 1.58 millimeters and I could get it exactly where I need it to be at that stage. So, <clears throat> so this will work out for me. I understand my fret slots will be a little bit deep on the first through whatever, fifth, sixth, tenth, whatever frets, and that's okay because I'm using rosewood and it'll, it'll, uh, it'll hide nicely. So anyway, hopefully that explanation helps and uh, at least you know what I'm using, but you may use a different number depending upon your circumstances. So think about it, figure it out, draw it out in CAD if you need to visualize it. I could have done this for what's it at the first fret and then I could have adjusted my depth of cut as I go down the fretboard, but that would have taken a whole lot longer. So do what's best for you. Rolling into part three, this is going to be a fairly busy episode. This may cover our next two classes at the school. Um, so let's go first things first, write down the order here. We've got a fretboard, we've got it slotted, we haven't sized it, we haven't squared it, we haven't done anything with it other than make sure it was flat and then cut the mount the, uh, the template and then cut the slots in there. There's a lot of choices that I could make of which way to start shaping what I need to shape here. And for me, I'm going to start on the Telecaster style. I might do something slightly different on the uh, Stratocaster that I'm building in class, but we can talk about that in class. Um, but for the Telecaster, I'm going to shape this fretboard to be exactly the right size. And then this will become my template after that. So I'm going to go that route. I'm going to cut that line close to the line, okay, I'm not going to go over the line, but maybe within like a millimeter of that line on the bandsaw. Now, do not, recommendation, do not mount this template and then cut it on the bandsaw. What's the worst thing that could happen? The worst thing that can happen is you don't control the bandsaw blade well enough and you cut through the line and not only do you damage and, and compromise your fretboard but now you've just ruined your template at the same time so at least if you're going to ruin one or the other just just ruin one rather than both all right so so we drew the line the outline of the template i'm going to freehand it to within a millimeter or so and then we're going to come back and get it ready to go to the router table so we'll be right back okay now we've got this cut I'm about a millimeter, maybe two millimeters from the, the line that I drew on here. Now one thing I want to mention to you, just in case you're kind of new at this whole guitar building thing, is when you cut off pieces of wood, like that fretboard that we just did, save all those pieces. All right? You never know you're going to get a chip or something like that and you need to find a grain that matches that chip in order to kind of... Uh, basically see it into see it into place and then kind of reshape it and fill and things like that or for even like the the excess slots that are in the side after you get your fret installed you may need some some rosewood um, sawdust in order to mix with the the CA in order to fill those gaps and in, in that case you're going to want to save all these extra parts so just a little heads up on that we're going to do the similar thing to what we did uh, when we were drilling the holes and slotting. And that's we're going to take a couple uh, relatively small pieces of double stick. And we're going to put them nicely spaced on the fretboard in order to install our template. What I like to do is start Start with one, just kind of pushing through so that I can line it up on that side. And then I'm going to cut that off and get another one on the opposite corner. I still can lift this up so I can kind of make sure it fits right in there. And then I'll start securing the, the double stick. All right, now we have it secured into place. Now I did just uh, put a couple and a little bit of water over those pins to make them swell and get a little tighter. Depending upon what your humidity level is, where you live and what time of the year it is, 
uh, you may have the same problem as me. It's 18% it's humidity in my shop right now, and those dowel uh, rods, those eighth inch dowel rods are a little bit constricted. So I'll fill them up with a little bit of water, make them swell, fill in the gap, and make sure that is a super tight fit. <clears throat> At this point, we're going to go ahead and take it right to the, the router table and just do a quick flush cut all the way around. All right, I'm using a quarter inch solid carbide spiral bit uh, with a bearing on the top as we're looking at it out of the router table, so the bottom of the bit basically. And we're going to use that against our template and cut nice and easy. Now anyone that's ever used a router table before or at any extensive amount of time, there may be a time that you had a close call with the router table. Router tables are nothing to mess with. Uh, I am dead serious about this. I have had necks fly out of my hands because the router bit grabbed the wood and launched it and I'm looking just to make sure I still got 10 digits. So I always use and strongly recommend that the hand that's closest to that bit is always using some sort of push block to both control it from grabbing, but also to keep your fingers away from that bit. Do what you want, but that's what I recommend. Whenever you get a chance to collect sawdust, collect it and put it in a bag. You never know when you're going to need it. We should be done with this fretboard template now, so I'm going to take it off. If you go through the trouble to make yourself plexiglass templates, or those of my students that are using the, the uh, plexiglass templates, acrylic templates, that I spent my time making, here's my recommendation. Do not try to pull the acrylic off of the wood. The wood will give a lot more than that acrylic will. So just take a, a blade and just start slowly lifting and you'll hear that, uh, that double stick release. And just keep working the blade down. And keep that acrylic flat on the table. That way there's no additional stress on it. All right. Now once we have this, this now becomes our template, right? And those pins will snap into the pins that we have already, the holes that we've already um, secured into place on the neck blank itself. But we're not ready to glue this down. Why, Steve? Why can't we glue it down? I want to glue it down. Okay, we have plenty of time to glue it down. Here's, here's why. You could do it now. But I've got, I've got this slotted trust rod going into this guy. And it's almost the same deal if you're using um, a spoke wheel, is you can't put it in yet until you get the neck flush cut. If you're using a truss rod access through the headstock area, you still have to drill a hole once we create that slope on the front of the on the front of the head the top of the headstock so we don't want that in the way so because I do not want to put my uh, my truss rod in we can't glue this on yet so hold off on that but be patient we're gonna get there and so at this point I've got to start the cut now I don't even need this mounted on there even temporarily to do that so I'm just gonna set that to the side now let's talk about headstock thicknesses on the fender style of neck, the most common thickness is 9 sixteenths. All right, 9 sixteenths of an inch. There are some in history that you can find that are as thin as a half an inch. All right, half an inch seems a little bit thin in my book. 9 sixteenths is what I'm shooting for, but I like millimeters and the accuracy of millimeters, so I'm going to convert that over to 14.28 millimeters. Now, it doesn't really matter if it's 14.2 or 14.4, it's, it's close enough. The thing that's driving the thickness of the neck in most cases, it's the tuners themselves. So you've got to look at the tuners that you're going to be using on your guitar, and you've got to begin threading it and seeing what is the minimum and maximum 
thickness of that headstock and still get a good number of threads going or not bottoming out the threads. My favorite tuners to use at this point in time are hip shot tuners. I like their locking tuners that have the open back so the gear is exposed. Why are they my favorite? Well, for two reasons. Number one, they look really cool. All right, especially if you're getting like black um, or the chrome and you've got that brass gear in there. It's just, it's just cool looking. Even the gold looks fine, but just you don't get as much contrast there. And, and I like the locking open back tuners because they have a gear ratio of 18 to 1, and I like a little bit higher ratio. Uh, the, more, the higher the ratio, the more that you can fine tune them. Now, you don't want like a 30 to 1 or something like that, or you go to tune the thing and you'll just be cranking, 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 cranking. When you go to string it up and get everything up to pitch, it's going to be insane. So you don't want to do that. But that's why I like them. Now, I happen to know that I can go as thin as about, ooh, I think it was like 13.75 and as big as like 14.5 or 14.7, somewhere in that range. So I've got about a millimeter of leeway to go one way or the other. I generally always shoot in the middle, so I'm shooting for about 14.25. 14.28 is 9 16 so really I'm, I'm going to be right in that ballpark of 9 16 Now there's a couple ways to scoop this area out and take down the distance um, on this headstock. The methods that I have used to thin out the top of the headstock has been to rough cut it out with either a bandsaw, so you do a little resawing operation up until where that, that radius would start, or a little bit short of that would be preferable, and then you cut kind of a little angle and meet that and get that piece of wood out of there. That's the fastest way to do it, and I like doing it. The only, the only problem with that is you need a bandsaw that is highly tuned tracks perfectly straight, preferably at least a half inch, if not three quarters of an inch uh, blade on it so that it kind of has the stability to track because there's nothing worse than going to a quarter inch blade on a bandsaw thinking you're going to slice off about four millimeters of wood and then it ends up creeping um, and, and going into the area that you need. At that point, it's called a design modification. You're going to have to put a veneer or something like that on top of your headstock or start over. So you got to be real careful. I encourage you to always do a test piece. Draw a same line um, that we have on our, on our headstock, the side of our headstock here. Draw it on a scrap piece of wood and test that bandsaw to see if it tracks straight. Some of the keys for tracking straight is obviously the setup in the bandsaw. It can take a while to set it up right but also not over forcing the wood through it. So you want to kind of let the teeth do the cutting. If you have a dull blade, it sucks. All right, so there's no two ways around that. A good blade, the right blade, the right technique, this is the easiest way possible. If you're not brave enough to start with the bandsaw and fear that you're going to mess everything up, here's the second technique that I would recommend. It's called a safety planer and it's a device that mounts into the drill press. Now at school they have, they have both this method and a bandsaw, so I leave it up to you to choose which, what, you, what you want to use. But this mounts in a drill press and you basically just take whatever sixteenth of, a, of an inch of material off at a time while passing this underneath the bandsaw back and forth until you get to your stop line and then you move it down a little further, you take a little bit more off and, and you get it where you need to be. Now the first step I recommend shooting for about 15 millimeters. You don't want to go right for the 14.28 ish. All right, so shoot for about 15. Shoot a little fatter if you, if you feel like you're or afraid that you're going to mess up. But I'm going to shoot for about 15 and then we're going to sand down the rest of it and there's two different techniques to sand. So I'll show you this at school in the class if, you, if you're interested in using the safety planer. We'll help you get it set up and going. Uh, if you want to use the bandsaw, then watch what I'm going to do because that's basically what I'm using now. This is where that old adage comes into play, measure twice, cut once. But I'd say measure as many times as you need to in order to make sure that when you cut, you've got it right. So I've double checked and I've got just a hair over 15 millimeters set for my resaw on this bandsaw. There's the 
piece that we just cut off right there. Less than an eighth of an inch. Okay, and then we've got what we need here. Now I would, I would shy away from that corner cut and just leave a little bit of wood that kind of breaks off at that point because if you cut too far, that's an issue. And so just avoid that. I took my fretboard that has already been flush cut and I used the locator pins to place it with, again, a couple pieces of double stick tape onto this fretboard. Now when we finish the shaping of the front of the headstock, uh, we're going to have that included in the process, so it'll get it pretty much right where it needs to be. So the best way I know to get this perfect is with a sander. Now I've got two different types of sanders that I'm going to show you here. Why? Because I'm a nice guy. That's why. No, that's not why. The reason is the school has this sander. They have a jet oscillating spindle sander. And if you watch one of my previous videos recently, you've seen this guy, Model Machines 6 inch wide drum sander that I had modified. Now some of the differences between these two is I've got to put a straight edge on this guy. And this is why we're leaving the headstock and the neck square until we get this done. I need something to ride flat on that table. You can do it otherwise, but it's not easy. And you have a higher probability of messing up. I've got in here a two inch spindle and in my other machine is a two inch spindle. Well, what's the difference between the two? I'm looking for a one inch radius right here. The difference is this two inch spindle, the rubber itself is two inches and by the time you get to the outside of the sandpaper, you're looking at two and a sixteenth, two and three thirty seconds, somewhere around there. Not a big deal. This guy though, since I had that drum custom made, I had it custom made so it would be two inches after the sandpaper was on. So that is going to be a true one inch radius on that guy. Now for my students, I will tell you that you should learn how to use this since that's what the school has for to use. But I'm going to bring my machine in and if some of you want to try it out or do maybe your last final passes to make sure it's perfectly square, that's cool. Um, so I made this straight edge out of MDF. It's just a 90 degree angle. After gluing up the MDF, I ran it across the jointer and so I know it's perfectly square. That spindle is measured to be square, so we should be good. This guy is perfectly parallel in that drum and then it's got two perpendicular side rails so I can work it on both sides of that drum in that case. So that's pretty cool. my class do yourself a favor and even if you're using the jet sander uh, to create this fender headstock save your last few passes for this guy this thing is so much more accurate there's just there's no comparison I mean I said it was 14.3 but I've got 14.3 and 14.31 This is an amazing machine. In fact, this is another machine that I have requested that the school purchase. And I think they're going to purchase at least two, if not more, uh, because they're so compact, it can be pulled out by the students when, when it's needed, put on the workbenches, and used with that kind of accuracy. So hopefully they get about five of these bad boys in the shop. We'll see how that goes. All right, so now that we have this perfectly done, what do we do from here, Steve? If this was a headstock access truss rod, 
then you're going to need to drill that hole at this point in time. Uh, now I have a jig that I use for that and I'm bringing that into class so those of you using that type of truss rod um, I'll have that and I'll show you how to use it in class. For those of you out in the YouTube world uh, that don't have a jig and maybe would like to see my jig that's kind of a separate episode because it's it might take a while to show the features of it and the adjustability of it and how it works so I think I'll try to do that in the next whatever couple weeks for everyone else. We're getting really close to being able to glue on this fretboard. I'm going to rough cut out and follow my lines and get it again within a couple millimeters, one to two millimeters of my lines. Uh, and then I'm going to flush cut the heel. Okay, and I'm going to do that because I've got that slotted um, truss rod and I just in case I had it sticking out slightly too far, I don't want my my router bit coming in contact. All right, now you can use that same quarter inch flush cut bit if you'd like to, but the thinner the bit, the more flex it's going to have, therefore it's not as accurate. So what I'm going to use is my Beast 7 8 inch diameter solid carbide spiral double bearing white side bit. I bet you I couldn't say that again. <laughs> this this bit is a beast and uh, and it's sharp. So that's going to be a better bit for more stability to get in this hard maple um, and and doing the full three quarters of an inch all in one pass. So that's what we're going to do here. Now, <clears throat> like I mentioned before, I could flush cut this entire fretboard, this neck to the fretboard because. I know the pin alignment is going to be dead perfect. Out of good practice, I'm only going to do the heel, what I have to do before gluing on. Then I'm going to glue on the fretboard because that will ensure that the fretboard doesn't shift even the slightest. And if it does, I flush cut to it and all things are good. So that's why I'm going to do it that way, just out of good practice. But you can see the heel is now perfectly flush cut. Now I'm going to insert that truss rod and make sure that it doesn't stick out any bit past flush. All right, we've got our truss rod. Let's just make sure now that we got the end of this flush cut, I want to make sure the truss rod does not stick out. Got my trusty fret hammer, I like to call Betty. And we're going to tap that in. just so it, it drops. And sure enough, our truss rod is sticking out ever so slightly, maybe a 16th, maybe a 32nd. Not much, but more than we want. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna square off this channel here. All right, I think I increased it enough where it should fit now. All right, that's much better. That is perfectly flush. Now we're going to, have to pull this out one more time to get a little bit of silicone underneath the two brass blocks. All right, we don't need much silicone, just about enough, about this, I don't know, half the size of a pea probably. And we're going to get this as far in position as we can. All right, my last chance to clean the belly. I'm gonna put a little half inch tape over the truss rod. I had somebody comment one time that that doesn't stop the glue from getting into the truss rod channel. And that statement is true because the purpose of this is not to stop it from getting in there the purpose is just to make cleanup a little bit easier. Um, if you're getting glue in the truss rod channel, you're probably, you're probably using too much glue. 
because this has got about an eighth inch gap on either side of that truss rod channel. And if I cover it with glue everywhere uh, besides that tape and I put the pressure on it, it'll basically squeeze some of that out, but there shouldn't be so much glue on there that it squeezes out that much. There we go. That's looking at just the right amount of glue. Not too much, not too little. And now we're ready to rock and roll. The back is easy to fit in because you can feel where it's flush. So that'll lock in pretty, pretty easily. The front, just line it up the best you can. Make sure those pins aren't too tall where it's sitting proud. I think we're pretty good here. All right, everybody having fun now? These clamps work fine. We get a little bit of squeeze out. And I've got so many of them that I can space them every couple few inches. And with the thickness of the fretboard being uh, either a quarter or five sixteenths of an inch, uh, it'll disperse the pressure pretty well along that couple inch span in between clamps. And we'll wrap it up with a couple of the bigger ones. All right, we got a very, very little bit of beading of glue all the way out that, very little bit. What that tells me is there's enough glue that there's not starvation going to happen in the joint, but that there's not so much that you got glue and globs running down the neck, which, which is never good. So how about we give that an hour or two to dry and we come back and we flush cut this neck. That'll be a huge accomplishment. All right, see you in a little bit. Welcome back. It's been a couple hours. Didn't seem that way for you, I'm sure. Let's get this out of the clamp and uh, clamps. And we're going to take it to the router table and do a, a flush route with the neck, making it flush to the fretboard, as you remember from what seems like just seconds ago. Hey, don't get too greedy when you're following the fretboard with that bottom bearing. Don't get too greedy and get all the way to the edge where you risk dipping off of the edge of the fretboard with the bearing and then you just had a de design modification to your neck. Uh, don't want to do that. So stop a good whatever you need to, a quarter inch, half inch short of that just to make sure that you don't, don't mess up. All right, now that we have the neck flush cut with the fretboard, I mean, we're good. Those dimensions are dead on, and this is a sexy, sexy piece of wood. Am I right? So now we like to break out the full template. On the Telecaster, there's no difference between the back and the front template, so I only have one, and that's because the heel is flush cut. So let's go ahead, and we're going to line that up. Because of the way the neck is going to be contoured on the back, we can easily take three or maybe even four millimeters um, deep in those holes. Let's shoot for three millimeters on those. Now, 
on the heel area, you can use these two, but know that there's going to be holes in the bottom of the heel. Now, the heel is going to be in the pocket, and it really doesn't matter. So if you want that extra peace of mind security, go ahead and put them in there. I'm not going to, though, because the, the main stress of this is going to be up at the front end because the only thing left to route is the headstock. And I'm not so much worried about the tail, uh, the heel side of this, because I'm going to have two pins in here which will stabilize it and support that double stick tape and everything will be fine. Double check again that everything is still flush and it's it's great. And make sure there's yep. Make sure there's nothing cut away shorter than the plastic uh, acrylic template. And there's not. Got pretty close on a couple of these. I only got about a half millimeter to spare, but we got it where we need it. Now we're going to go back and we're going to flush cut basically everything that we didn't do before. So from this point all the way up and around. Now, I know what my students are thinking. Steve, isn't, isn't routing the end grain a very difficult thing to do? Doesn't the uh, maple have a tendency to chip out really easily? And you guys are absolutely correct. I'm glad you're thinking that way uh, because we've come this far. The last thing that we want to do is to chip out the end of the headstock and incur another what design modification okay don't want to do that so here's what I'm going to do to help prevent it technique is going to go a long way number one we're never going to start a routing process on the end grain we're always going to start it on the long grain and then work our way around to it now we don't want that to chip out so Here's a technique. I'm sure there's many techniques to help resolve this, but here's one that I've had pretty good fortune with, and that is to use Wizard's Wipe Down to actually moisten the area. Now, the side benefit of this is Wizard's Wipe Down also creates better tone out of the guitar. Uh, that was taught to me by uh, one of my luthier mentors, uh, Joe Naylor. Are you guys buying this? <laughs> Water is fine. It's just that this is a spray bottle I had next to me. So I'm going to moisten all of the, the neck headstock area. Let that kind of soak in. If it starts to look dry by the time I get over there, I am going to moisten it again. Basically, what you're doing is you're allowing the wood to bend and not break. Um, and there may be little fuzzies that are left over, but those will sand off so quick and easy. I guarantee you that it'll be easier than trying to repair a chip on the end of your headstock. So let's go do it. Now, the other thing is we're going to hold on to this bad boy tight and we are going to work our way all the way around in that clockwise di direction. And uh, we're not going to try to enter in the end grain. Um, Trust me on that one. All right, here we go. See that? Perfect headstock shape. Not a single chip. plus better tone. In this episode, the last thing that we are going to do is drill out the tuner holes. Now, I will say this. I'm going to drill the tuner holes while the template is still in place, and I'm going to go right through my holes in my headstock. 
you won't be able to do that, or I should say you may not be able to do that, those of you in my class, because the standard headstock template that I've uh, created for the class to use, the standard Fender one, it's got 10 millimeter holes. Now, the size of the holes that you use for your tuners may not be 10 millimeters. That's about the largest that typically they are, and it's fairly standard. Um, but many are less than that. So it just depends on the design of tuners. You're going to have to look in the instructions for the tuners that you purchase for the class and uh, and it'll tell you. Now for the hip shot tuners that I'm using, I know that I need a 5 16 hole all the way through and then from the back to the front I need to drill a kind of more of a kind of more ream out up to 10 millimeters in the back down to about the eighth inch mark from the front. And if I drill with the headstock flat on a scrap piece of wood, then when that reaming device hits bottom, it'll stop cutting and it'll be perfect. So I know what I need. So therefore, since my holes in my template are exactly 5 16 what I needed for the smallest hole, I'm going to drill right through these templates. Now, if you want a 10 millimeter hole to go all the way through, you could also drill through the template. But here is the catch. You need a 10 millimeter Forstner bit and not a regular brad point bit because if you use the regular brad point bit, then the tuner holes will get larger and larger every time you use it, and these templates won't be good for, you know, but one class probably with as many people that are going to use it. So, so you'll have to kind of adjust fire. What I would recommend is that you actually just draw out the circles of the tuners and then uh, draw a straight edge connecting the center of all those tuners together and then another mark going across and then you use like a center punch to punch out the center of those and then drill the appropriate size hole that you need and at that point you can use a brad point bit to line up on the little punch holes and go all the way through. So that's the only thing different that I will say for those of you that are in my class. Just any scrap piece of wood underneath. Use about 600 RPMs for this one. There we go. Five more times. All right, here is a reaming bit. This has a 5 16 end. That's about an eighth inch or so tall and then a 10 millimeter, just a hair under 10 millimeter for the rest of the way. It works super duper with the hip shot tuners that I use, but it works with a lot of other brands too. So you just have to figure out what, what you have and if this will do the same purpose for you. Uh, I'm gonna mount this in the drill press and then I'm gonna take the template off and then drill back to front and ream out uh, those 5 16 most of the way through, all the way down to 10 millimeters. All right, I'll turn that down to about 400 RPMs and just go nice and easy. You gotta keep it flat on the board. That's your stopping point. When that blunt end hits the board, you are done. Ten millimeters in the back, five sixteenths at the front. Let's do it again. I think I need a few more RPMs. Let's take it up to six hundred.
have it. 610 millimeter, 6516. All right, long episode. A lot of stuff we covered. And for my students, we'll cover this again in class with the Stratocaster style net neck with the 22 uh, frets. But this is right where you need to be uh, by the end of this, this week, basically, by the end of Saturday. Um, those of you watching on YouTube, obviously, you're doing it at your own pace, so refer back to this. So here's what we covered today. Uh, we covered thicknessing the headstock. We talked about drilling for access, but this particular neck didn't need it. We'll do that in, in class. We talked about routing the heel before we glued on the fretboard. Then we inserted the truss rod, glued on the fretboard. Then we flush cut the entire uh, fretboard area of the neck. And then we use the, the back template to flush cut with the template the headstock shape. And then we went and we drilled our tuner holes for the hip shot tuners that I'm going to be using and you'll adjust fire accordingly. So now we have a neck that is ready for the f next stages. So there we have it. Another good day in the shop. Hey, remember, no matter what you do, start with excellence. <laughs>